many of you are looking for money? <laughs> okay, okay, all right. So uh, I'm gonna sit down and um, it's great to have all of the speakers here today. And before we start the discussion, I'd like to um, give a chance to each of our speakers to introduce yourself. Thank you for the um, uh, introduction. My name is Watana. I'm from Khmer Enterprise. Uh, we are a unit under the Ministry of Economy and Finance to provide support to startups, businesses, entrepreneurs uh, through capacity upgrading, uh, seed funding, business networking, and public relations. Uh, so um, my division primarily focuses on uh, funding. So we provide grant funding and equity investment. At the same time, in addition to the funding we provide to entrepreneurs, we also provide uh, capacity upgrading through program in order to help them upgrade their capacity, but also the skills in order to use the fund more effectively. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dominic Mello. I work for ADB, the Asian Development Bank. Um, maybe some of you don't know that ADB actually has a, a venture capital arm. It's called the ADB Ventures which we started in 2020. And since then, we have invested in about 50 companies across Southeast Asia and South Asia. So I'm responsible for our operations in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, my name is Samrat. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Cambodian Investor Corporation. Uh, we do the investment, in fact, so we invest into the business. And recently, we just started um, investing into a, a startup. So hopefully that we can invest more uh, startup. So um, our investment uh, philosophy is uh, we, um, uh, we, we provide the investment with the support within our community-based uh, financing solution that we can provide to the, to the business. So small and medium enterprise and also uh, startup. And also other uh, potential, uh, good, good potential uh, project, investment project that also can get return uh, for the investor. Because we are, we, are in, we are the investment platform that we, need, we may need the fund of the investor to invest into the business. Okay, so um, that, that is about a CIC. In shortcut, you can call us a, a CIC. Um, any business that um, you need money, just come and talk. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, my name is David. I've lived in Cambodia for 14 years now and I manage Emerging Markets Consulting. Um, my background was originally in technology. I used to work in telecoms, then uh, a software startup, software development startup. I've invested in around four or five businesses per personally in uh, technology, food and beverage, retail. And um, yeah, EMC, we're a business consulting outfit. We do some work in the technology sector, primarily around digital business models and platforms. Uh, we also do a lot of work in traditional business sectors. Uh, we tend to work a lot with uh, foreign companies looking to enter the market. We also do quite a lot of work with organizations like ADB, World Bank, on uh, business environment stuff. Thanks very much. Thank you very much of all the speakers. I have one burning question that I really want to ask all of them before we start our serious discussion. Um, can I ask, what's the most interesting thing about you? David. Uh, not, not a lot of people know this, but I used to be a violinist. I used to be a violinist. Oh, okay. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Um, how about Bong Sam Rak? <laughs> it's hard to define even myself. <laughs> but uh, what, what is a good thing? I think maybe helping people is my, uh, is my, uh, my best thing ever that I, I like to share happiness with others. Dom, please. Um, I, um, I invest as well, and uh, I've made some investments in some companies I've 
that uh, I, I'm very passionate about. Like uh, I'm owner of a craft beer company in Vietnam uh, called Seven Bridges, and we also recently started to supply to Cambodia. So yeah, if if some of you like craft beer, then please drink Seven Bridges. So I'm also taking this chance to market my own products. I would consider an episode in my life that would be special is when I spent probably two years living in Myanmar, just right before the coup and also the COVID-19. So I traveled back to Cambodia just right before the coup and COVID-19. Yeah. Wow, very interesting experience. Um, thank you very much. Okay, um, I asked this question because I just want to show to you that not all investors are scary. Uh, we're not scary people. We're very, really outgoing people. I mean, although we grill you with a lot of questions before we give you money. Um, so uh, let's start with the first serious question. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the overview of the investment landscape, but we're not going over the mainstream discussions, which is what is it like or um, like an overview. Um, I have one question for each of you, which is what are the main barriers? What are the main barriers uh, for investment uh, from your perspectives in Cambodia? Um, the perception of barriers will change depending on what kind of uh, investor you are, I think, a lot. Um, so hopefully we'll get lots of different answers. We've recently been speaking to a lot of regional institutional investors, VCs, guys like that. So from their perspective, when they look at Cambodia, biggest challenges for them will be um, overall size of the market. Um, they will be look at Cambodian companies and they don't necessarily see a strong track record of exporting products and services outside Cambodia. So they'll look at a Cambodian company through the lens of what is their addressable market here in this country. Uh, and Cambodia is relatively small. So depending on the product or service you're making, the overall the size of market um, could be a big issue. Um, acquiring human resources, so finding and keeping talented staff typically is considered to be um, a big challenge in Cambodia. And Investors are looking for larger companies, so to deploy more capital. They're really interested to know who you have working for you. What are their incentives for them to go and stay on your growth journey? Um, also, I think for a foreign investor looking in Cambodia, um, they don't necessarily see a lot of opportunities. So that can make investing in one or two de deals in Cambodia relatively expensive. Um, also, if you're an internal investor, it can be quite difficult to diversify, right? So, not realistically, not every, every investment a, um, uh, a guy makes is going to be wildly successful. So, usually you want to go and spread the risk by investing in a number of them. And it can be sometimes quite difficult in Cambodia to get diversification uh, because you might not see that many opportunities. rest of the speakers any one of you would like <clears throat> okay so to be true investing in startup is very risky for the investor rather than investing in real estate so that's why most of the investor they prefer investing in the real estate more secure easy convenient and not involved with uh, the people that the that because of, of investor mindset and behavior, the startup they stuck all the way on raising funds from the investor. So we need we need more more VC or other investor from outside of the country to come and and also uh, bring other investor to to contribute uh, to invest into the startup. Other thing, other thing. Okay, market is is small, but uh, many startup they inspire that um, the market of. Algerian is kind of 700 uh, million population or something, but you have uh, inspiration is good, but you have to be true and and on your own brain how you run the business. You you treat Cambodia as the base, and you have to survive in the base uh, market itself before you grow up to other uh, uh, 
to, to regionally. Um, other, other thing that I can think is about the business valuation because of uh, mismatch between the investor and startup. So normally when uh, the startup entrepreneur, they, they start the business and then maybe sometimes they just have the proof of concept and they value the, the business uh, very high. That is not much to the investor uh, perspective. Uh, we think the value that they, they seek for uh, uh, for the investment. And another thing is about the exit, because normally when you invest in something, exit is the most critical uh, challenging for the investor in Cambodia. When you invest in a business, especially into the startup, you have to think how you can get the money back, right? It's not easy. We, we are not the financial hub like uh, Singapore. So investing in startup, we play in the financial game for sure. But we don't have the financial hub to play the financial game. So that's why when the investor look, look into the startup uh, deal, they carefully look into the operation and the transaction and also the traction that the startup uh, have made uh, so far and how they survive and how they grow internally in Cambodia first before uh, going regionally. Yeah, um, other thing maybe related is uh, impression of um, investor and startup entrepreneur itself. So running a startup or running your business is a long run way, but investor might need to get their investment very fast. And the startup entrepreneur, they might stuck on the way and they have no will to continue the, the startup. So, so this, is, this, is, this is about the mindset and behavior that we, we have to think about, both investor and, and startup uh, entrepreneur, plus other environment, um, environmental uh, uh, um, ecosystem that, that not enough player in the field to, to support the startup. And also the digital adoption, is, uh, is the rate is very low compared to the, to the average of the of the of the Asian uh, uh, country, I think that that is the, the barrier that we have to solve one by one. There, there are ways to solve it one by one, but uh, uh, we have to to think and work together in the ecosystem um, uh, to solve this uh, uh, barrier. Yeah, thank you. Maybe my my view of Cambodia will be a little bit different um, from the others from the perspective that I'm a regional investor and I'm not uh, based in Cambodia. And um, you know, the, out of the 50 investments we made in the last um, three years, um, actually one was in Cambodia, only one, but we, we hope that we can make more. Um, I think th there were three reasons I was going to give to the challenges, and actually two of them were already covered by um, David already. And um, one, you know, the market size, for sure, and also difficulties exiting. I, I completely agree with these two. So maybe the only one that I would add and this is just from my limited knowledge of Cambodia because I'm still quite new, um, it's around the, the cultural mindset of the entrepreneur and the business owners. Because when you raise investment, it, you're giving up some control of your business. You're giving up some share of your company to an outsider because you believe that that investor can help your company to grow. Um, but it's not easy for a lot of... Um, Cambodians, traditional, not even Cambodia, but I would say in, in Southeast Asia, it's not easy for a lot of, uh, tr especially traditional family businesses, to want to give up the share of their business. They want to continue to control 100%. Um, so really the, the mindset of someone that's willing to give up some share of their company because they want to have a, a smaller percentage of a much bigger company tomorrow is not something that maybe comes naturally. And I think this will take time and it requires some more and more communication and understanding of also what is what when you should take equity and what does an investor bring to your business. Um, so I think this is something that will happen naturally over time, but it's still something that we are encountering as um, a, as a as a point of uh, not a challenge, but something that will take time for each side to understand each other. Thanks. I would like to share similar views from the other speakers. So I think the main barrier for uh, Cambodia, especially for the investment aspect, is the low number of investable companies. So when we're talking about the um, capital that is going into Cambodia to make investment, 
there is a cost that the fund manager will need to pay back to the investor. So because Cambodia is a small country and we are competing with Vietnam, Thailand, which is a very uh, a, a much bigger country than Cambodia. So that means the consideration of Cambodia as an attractive destination is less attractive from the investor's point of view because they already have this big market in, uh, in the region. So uh, from our perspective, uh, as an ecosystem builder at Command Enterprise, we want to create, uh, plan more seats uh, through capacity upgrading, but at the same time promote, uh, like Dave, uh, Dominic mentioned, the uh, mindset of uh, traditional business that the new generation of the uh, business owner, probably the children of the uh, parents, are now starting to take over the business that they can be more exposed to the, the new way of running business, maybe taking inspiration from Thailand or Vietnam. So this is something that we try to do at Khmer Enterprise, is to build the ecosystem to make it more attractive for Cambodia from other uh, investors in the region. And we also act as a uh, catalyst. So in this sense, we provide a catalytic capital through grant funding, for example, that entrepreneurs, startups, and business can use it to improve their enterprise or to upgrade their capacity before they accept the investment. So then the risk is lower and the investors also find it more attractive to invest in Cambodia as well. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I mean, we, I, I, took, I took some notes and I've, I've got a lot of uh, challenges that uh, are expressed by our speakers from the market to the lack of talents, tech talents, which is the main theme of our discussion today. Um, the mismatch expectation, the risk, the exits, the um, cultural mindsets, the uh, sizes of the companies, investables companies that are limited. So there are a lot of challenges. But um, I want to ask a question that I think will probably resonate with a lot of people here, which is how do you pick investments? Um, let me give a bit of context. In order for investors to s decide on one or two investments, uh, usually they look at um, whether the team are capable, they look at the business model, is it scalable enough, is it profitable, are there risks, are there uncertainties in investing in those business, the size, the valuation, and all these, right? But um, since our speakers are from different organizations, um, government organizations, and some of them are from um, you're from ADB Venture, we've got uh, CIC, and we've got uh, Emerging Market Consulting. What are the main priorities? Let's, let's say we all know that these are the criteria, but what are the main priorities for you in order for you to decide on any investment? It can start from um, any of you, maybe Bangsam right first, or, uh, yeah, or Dom, or... Yeah, so there, there are three things that we look for. Um, the first, of course, is the commercial return because um, you, can't, you can't invest in a company if you don't believe the company will succeed and scale commercially. And then the second for us is the impact uh, because we are a development bank. So the main impact that we focus on is uh, climate impact, which means uh, um, any technology or solution that can drive um, efficiencies in sectors like agriculture, for example, reducing the use of land, water, um, improve productivity. And the third important factor is that ADB has to be able to provide some additionality, something extra to the company that complements what other investors are providing to the company. Because it's not just about money, it, it needs to be smart money. So often when we invest in a company, we consider can ADB help in terms of our networks to help the company connect to new customers, new financiers, particularly if a company has ambitions to expand outside Cambodia to other regions. And maybe that's where sometimes our networks across the region can be very useful for companies when they make that step. So these are the three factors. It's commercial, which I think is anyway correlated with impact because unless a company does well commercially, you can't generate impact. And then what our value is added to the company. So uh, for us, uh, because we are the government arm um, of the uh, unit of the Ministry of Economy and Finance, 
So the way we look at investment is from, uh, so we, I think we have two tiers of investment. So the first one is the ecosystem side. So that means we are looking at the uh, idea and business model in the priority sectors that we focus on. So the end goal is to generate more value at the economy. So let's say, for example, uh, in the agricultural space. So we're looking to support entrepreneurs who are uh, converting raw materials into at least semi uh, finished product or at most uh, finished product so that there is more value add in the economy. So that is how we look to support entrepreneurs uh, or businesses in general. But at the same time, we also try to focus on the commercial return as well. So what that means is by using this metric, we know we can uh, pinpoint the kind of entrepreneur businesses that can be more can can be more sustainable, but at the same time our uh, value of money is also more effective in that sense. So it doesn't mean that uh, although we uh, are from the government, we also focus on the risk and return, just like a commercial investor. But we tend to take more risk and we try to go first because we would like to plant more seeds in that sense and we also focus more on uh, helping more a higher number of SMEs or businesses in general compared to uh, traditional or commercial investors in, in, in the field. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, every investor look for the commercial uh, viable uh, for sure of the business. Uh, for us, the first priority is people because we focus on um, on the entrepreneur itself and also the team of the entrepreneur. Um, at the end of the day, every business is run by people. So if we can deal with the great people that can bring the business model to the market, I think this is what we are looking for. Uh, second thing is about the future of the business industry. When we invest into the business, especially to the startup, we look at carefully into which industry is growing, what is the trend of industry. Um, and when we invest along the way, how much time that we can spend into the business that can commercialize their, 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 their product um, within the industry trend that can uh, uh, fit well to, into their business uh, uh, model. And of course, in, in CIC, one more thing is about ethical business. We invest only in ethical uh, uh, business only. Yeah, so other thing I think is a very uh, common for the uh, VC uh, uh, that they are look into the business, um, compliant, whatever, and so on. Yeah. Um, oh my God, that's loud. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I would... Um, well, the answers I would cl most closely identify with what Samarak just said. Um, I mean, in no particular order, uh, there needs to be a clear product market fit in the lingo. So the entrepreneur needs to have a clear understanding of what problem there is in the current market and how his product or solution or her product or solution will solve that. Obviously, it needs to be a reasonably large market. So and a growing market. Um, growing markets help relieve the burden of competition. It's a lot more difficult to compete in a market that is shrinking or not growing at all than it is to compete in a market that's growing a lot. And it, but most important for me, it really comes down to the entrepreneur. So, uh, and I, I'll be like really specific. I mean, if at a personal level or at a business level, when we're looking at um, investing in a business, it's the, the quality of the entrepreneur is the most important, and then the issue of sector and market and so forth comes afterwards. We tend to go and think that a successful entrepreneur is probably going to be successful irrespective of what their product or service is, or rather that's, that's the most important feature. Um, personally, I would like to see an entrepreneur who has actually a professional track record. Um, ideally, somebody who's worked in a reputable corporate environment in a position of managerial responsibility. They know how to hire staff, manage staff, incentivize staff. Uh, that's mirroring Sam Rack's comments earlier about staff being the most important. Uh, and they've been involved in making decisions. 
Uh, because as an entrepreneur, you need to make a lot of decisions very quickly um, throughout the course of your startup journey. So, yeah, I tend to look for people who are probably minimum of five years um, and probably longer experience in a good corporate environment in Cambodia. Thank you very much, uh, all speakers. Um, I, I took some notes, and I can I say, can, can I kind of summarize a little bit? Am I right to say for Khmer Enterprise that if you have a business that are in infrastructure, manufacturing, and uh, a business that you are able to bring raw materials into, you to put into some goods or products that can be sold in the market, you can get support from Khmer Enterprise. Is that right to say? Right, and for ADB Venture, um, you're looking for a business that has social impact. And that could also, in addition to impact, you look also at commercial returns. And at the same time, they also want to be unique provider of money, not just the financial itself, but something like value add, something that, a that only ADB itself can provide to the business. And for CIC, of course, you're looking for something critical, something that could disrupt the market, but something that could also bring commercial returns, something that, can, that is led by capable team or capable people. Um, so this kind of sums up on the overview of the investment landscape. On to the next um, talking point or discussion. Um, I want to touch on the future outlook of the uh, investment. Um, and I have a specific question for ADB, actually. Um, I read in the report that ADB just published, which is called uh, Cambodia's Ecosystem for Technology Startups. That was published um, in June 2022. And uh, you focused on four areas in, in that report, which are kind of the future sectors. One is agri-tech. Second is ad tech. Third is health tech, and the last one is green tech um, or clean tech. So something like renewable energy or uh, technology solutions for agriculture, irrigation, and all these that could be uh, game changing. So I want to ask you, uh, are they the main priority sectors for you right now and in the future? For, for Cambodia specifically. Um, so I'm, first, I think, I wanted to say that um, I think it's too narrow in Cambodia just to focus on technology businesses. Um, so I think for Cambodia, it, we would have a broader definition of how technology can be um, incorporated into business models. So for example, we're also very interested in more traditional um, agricultural businesses. Because I, I, when, I'm in, what I be, when I'm in Cambodia, I see amazing products and services. Um, in the tourism sector, in the manufacturing sector, agri-food processing. And often you find that the really good products, in the back end of the business, these companies have imported or integrated technology innovation to improve the product quality, the product efficiency. But the product itself is not technology. So I think when you, when you broaden it like that, then I, I see a lot of potential in Cambodia, uh, particularly in uh, food and agriculture. Of course, in areas like um, green technology, um, fintech, we are interested. And there may be opportunities in um, Cambodia. But I think it would be too narrow just to focus only on, on those areas. Thank you very much. Um, and for the rest of our speakers, um, what sectors do you have the highest hope of investing from today onward to the future? I can start from uh, Bong Samraik or uh, or Vatanai, yes. First. So I think uh, in terms of the sector that we think is the future, but also it's also in line with uh, the mandate that we get from the ministry is, the first one is agriculture. So as we know, we are experiencing more climate change impacts uh, on our everyday lives. And as you can see, the war in Ukraine also impact the cost of food. So I think going forward, agriculture is going to be a very pro promising area that investors should also give a serious look into investing. But also, the government side also has to support more. And from the previous work that we have done so far, probably around more than 50% of all the beneficiaries or grantees uh, that we support are from agriculture or agro-processing. 
So this is something that we want to keep in the, our pipeline so that uh, in the future, if they can grow further with our support, also on top of the funding that we're going to provide them, can ensure a sustainable and stable supply of food in Cambodia as well. So that is one. The other sector is manufacturing. As we know, Cambodia tried to uh, use the import from neighboring countries uh, to also boost more, ex boost more export uh, to the outside world as well. So one way of trying to connect the work that we have done in the agricultural space is to provide more support in the manufacturing or processing of these agricultural products uh, in order to export to overseas uh, market, but at the same time to substitute the import uh, in Cambodia as well. Uh, so these are the two sectors that we think uh, are very promising. And uh, fortunately, we have done a lot of work uh, uh, to support all these entrepreneurs and businesses in this sector as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Balsam Reich or uh, David, do you have any perspectives on this? Um, I mean, I don't know whether we'll end up investing in it because it's quite um, capital intensive, but I think logistics is probably a great sector that should grow, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity for disruption um, in Cambodia. Currently, logistics in Cambodia isn't very effective. Essentially, it's a kind of real estate play. If you're fortunate enough to own land outside Phnom Penh, you build a warehouse on it and call yourself a logistics company, um, and then you try to get some guys with construction materials or the garment sector to leave stuff in your warehouse for as long as possible. And that's not really how logistics works. Logistics is highly operationally sophisticated, and your value proposition for your customers is to move stuff as quickly as possible, not as slowly as possible. Um, I think there's tremendous scope for value addition in logistics services, from simple stuff like uh, packing, labeling, um, testing services, all the way through to more complex stuff like uh, direct store delivery. And hopefully, with the uh, better infrastructure coming into place, um, export markets for agriculture opening up, um, it will be a sector um, where we see a lot of activity over the next, uh, next few years. That's my hope. OK, so we still stick on our um, priority industry that we are thinking of. We call it fast. So first is finance, so it's finance-related industry. Agriculture-related industry, service industry, and technology industry. So I think it, it probably cover most of it, but uh, we, we are not uh, investing on in the heavy manufacturing or something because it's higher investment cost. So, so that's why, um, but, but most, most of the, especially for the tech, I think uh, the, the research from ADB is a uh, maxim that uh, um, agri tech, ed tech, health tech, and clean tech. But I would rather focus, uh, for the moment, agri tech is, should go first. Because um, we, we, we will have a lot of reform in the agriculture sector, for sure. Because we claim ourselves as an agriculture country since a long time ago. But, but we, need, uh, we need maybe cost efficiency, or we need to rearrange the supply chain and infrastructure. So everything that we, we need to do, um, we need uh, to embed the tech into the agriculture that we can have the cost efficient and compete with other countries, even the export, or even supporting to the line manufacturing or, or food processing industry. Um, and also, we think that we need to reframe our agriculture a little bit in, into like one region, one product, or something that we have scale, so we can uh, utilize uh, technology as a tool to support uh, agriculture and we grow from there. That is um, the, my, my perspective uh, within uh, uh, this uh, several years onward. Yeah. Thank you very much for the speaker's response. So you heard it today from the speakers that uh, the future sectors are fintech or financial industries. Another one is agriculture or agri or agro processing. Another one is manufacturing. And the last one is logistics and services. And I think COVID 
that happen for two years have shown or have proved to us that whatever happens to our world, we still need food. That's why agriculture is very important. No matter what happens, logistics is a key factor because we still need things delivered to our house. And in terms of uh, the financial uh, technology, it's also very important. We need to make payment no matter what happens, even if we still stay at home, and also the manufacturing. Um, so before we start the next point of discussion, um, I have one last question, um, which um, I think maybe some of you also have these questions too. What are the mistakes that they make? <laughs> what are the mistakes that they make when they come to you for money? Um, can start from, uh, yeah, sure, Dom. I, I, yeah, I, I would never, I would never um, put myself in a position where I feel like I'm uh, lecturing to founders and, and yeah. uh, company mm -hmm. business owners because you know they're the, some of the smartest people I ever meet and they will know their business, their product much better than me. Um, what I would say is that um, when, when we look at companies that we've invested in that have done well and companies we've invested in that haven't done well and companies that we almost invested but we decided maybe not to, uh, often it came down to the team dynamics. Um, so, I mean, as a so, and of course there are many different businesses. So, if you're a startup and you're just starting your own team, then the most important decisions that you'll be taking will be who do you who's going to be a co-founder, uh, who you're going to set up this business with, and often um, sometimes people rush into that decision, but it's so important and uh, to to really. Think about, you know, do you guys as a group or individuals have a common vision on where the company may be? Because things may be good in the early stages, but then you start to encounter issues later when you realize that you didn't share a common vision. So I, I think, I'm, I'm not calling it a mistake, but one of the issues that often founders face a few years in is just realizing that maybe there are some insurmountable um, cracks in the relationship with the other business partners that... Uh, they hadn't thought through everything when they first started it. And then for more established businesses like a family business, sometimes the challenge for those owners is giving up control and delegating and bringing new people into the business that can add value to the business and trusting that person, um, that's not easy as well. So again, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but the ability to, to, to bring in talent and trust that talent is something that also is not easy, but is very important if uh, some of these businesses want to go to the next level. Thanks. Thank you, Dom. Um, Balsam Wright, anything you want to tackle to the start founders? So, <laughs> I, I, I don't think they make a mistake. Maybe in, in, in somehow, they just don't aware of what, they are, what they are doing. Um, Maybe what, one of the thing is um, they might lose a focus on what they are doing. Sometimes they, they got a lot of idea, opinion, whatever that, that, that they can get from uh, many people. So they try to um, diversify or maybe try a new product, uh, just only one opinion only that maybe they lose the core of the product that they have to bring to the market. So, so for, for the startup entrepreneur, if you, think, if you think that your product is really a great product to the market, you have to focus on the core. But while focusing on the core of the product, you need a time commitment. Because sometimes, um, you cannot make money quickly within the core product and then you just go around of the core of the product just to get the money to, to survive. It's not, it's not a mistake because you also want to survive. But, but most of the time, when you go around of the core of your product, you forget the core. And then you just enjoy living with the subordinated um, um, a product that you, you generate the income easily just to survive for, for the short term. So 
focusing focusing to the to the core product and focus focus it easy to say but it's hard to do when every time when i meet with the startup entrepreneur what is your core product so why you diversify so much so within a platform what how how many product you have so what is the core so they need to focus on on, on the core um other thing that we can uh, see in in the startup um, uh, entrepreneur um, they they have a great idea they develop the product but they do not know how to commercialize the product in the market maybe they don't have the team to do the market research uh, properly so that's why um, they just go with their own idea just to create the market but in somehow create the market in Cambodia is not easy but if you have the product available in the big market might be easier for the startup entrepreneur to to take into the the, the product market uh, fit um, yeah I think it is related one one more one more thing is a um, commitment and will so for the startup itself you know it's a long and hard uh, journey time commitment is really important and don't go don't go to every network just selected network that you think that can support well to your startup journey thank you can we go to CIC networking events it, it depends it depends <laughs> if you think that it's a great uh, for you to join uh, you can come if you think other even that it fit well to um, to yourself, go to it, because we, we, we don't we don't say that uh, our event or KE even or maybe the Joe startup even is is good uh, and fit well to the startup entrepreneur. You startup entrepreneur, you have to define yourself. What do you need to grow your startup, and what kind of network that you want to stabilize and grow your startup sustainably. Thank you very much, Monson Reich. Um, Watanak, do you want? Do you have anything to add, or? Yes, I think um, I also echo the other speakers' uh, comment as well. I, I would not consider as a mistake, but something that uh, the founder probably have to reconsider again in terms of their focus. So, as a uh, some uh, as an organization who provide funding uh, to entrepreneurs. Uh, some of the time they try to raise a lot of financing that they don't necessarily need uh, Maybe they think it's a validation that the business is doing well, but I think uh, the focus should be on the customers so if they uh, raise a lot of money Probably the investor may see something that uh, the business is going to work but at the same time if you raise too much money and you do not know how to use that money effectively that can be challenging and that can be problematic w downstream impact uh, in the future for your business. So I think uh, the uh, overlooked aspect of this is that they should focus more on refining their products or services for their customers, not for the investors. It is good to raise money from the investors, but they also have their own agenda. I think the entrepreneur's agenda is to have great products or services in the market and the good validation metric is from the customers. If they are selling more, that means their business is more valuable. Not necessarily if they raise a lot of money. So, so something they, they should focus on more. I think this is the probably uh, the overlooked aspect that I uh, see in uh, some SMEs or startups that we have worked with. Thank you. Thank you, Watana. I mean, we hear a lot of complaints from startups which say, um, I can't do this yet because I need money. And then when I go to you for money, you don't give me money. How am I able to do it? So it's like chicken and egg thing, right? But I think entrepreneurs need to remember that they need to pass one important test, which is, are they able to bootstrap? Are they able to show us that they are committed enough to their startup, to their idea, to their business, to a point in which that they deserve the money that they're asking for. Um, but I'm talking from investors' point of view because I work in investment, but I'm for you, I'm for you. I'm on your side too. <laughs> okay, um, 
So this is the second point of our discussion. Let us move on to the last point, which is the digitalization and demographic development. And I hear again and again on this panel, we talk about tech talents, we talk about the team. The team is an integral part of your criteria. Tech talents are, are lacking in, in our society, the lack of capacity, the, the tech skills. So um, I have a question for uh, all of you, and this is a macroeconomic question. And then starting from there, we're going to drill down to micro. Um, so let's talk about demographic development and digitalization. I want to understand from your perspectives if and how technology and digitalization disrupt the labor market, if and how. Let me give a bit of context. Um, it is known that Cambodia uh, is a young population, but the recent data show uh, from the UN, from ADB's classification of countries, that we are, in fact, aging. <laughs> we're aging, which means that we're no longer young like we used to be. The population that are uh, 65 and over are increasing probably because of low infertility rate, of, of increased life expectancy. So in a way, we're maturing. There's, there's demographic involvement to a more older, uh, a more, uh, you know, older, more mature population. And so do you see it as a challenge? Do you see it as a challenge for digitalization? and ways forward in our effort? Um, I, uh, I, I don't see it as a big challenge, I guess, um, for two reasons. In terms of um, our demography here in Cambodia, um, even 20 years from now, we'll have a smaller population of uh, over 65, and for example, Indonesia does today. So if you want to look at a ASEAN country, which is aging quite rapidly, then look at Thailand, right? But we're going to stay quite young for quite some time. Um, not as young as we are now, but still pretty young. Um, and if you look over the next, say, 20 years or so, that will actually benefit Cambodia. Um, if you assume that in any labor force, the most productive members of the population, the workforce, are aged somewhere between, say, 35 and 55. So they've not retired, uh, but at 35 years old, they have a lot of experience, right? So that's typically considered to be the most uh, kind of productive age in a labor force. So at the moment, that cohort, and I apologize to everybody aged between 35 and 55, which includes me, incidentally, um, but at the moment in Cambodia, that age court is not particularly digital savvy at all, and yet they're the people who are making decisions around how to deploy money, how companies are run, how policy is formulated. But over the next 20 years, it will be the younger generation in Cambodia who start making those decisions, who start running those companies. Uh, and the guys who are between 20 and 30 years old now, they are digital savvy. And they're a lot more uh, educated. They understand how to use technology a lot better. So actually, I think over the next 20 years, um, the current demography of Cambodia will actually benefit the country. Uh, it will contribute to faster rates of digitalization. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I see that uh, Dom is... I was gonna, yeah, and I was going to say I, I, I agree with David. I think it's more an opportunity than a challenge uh, because actually the, the more developed economies, uh, like my, my mom lives in London in the UK, and, and I think Japan and is facing some similar challenges. The population is quite old and many of the older people in these developed countries are not technology savvy. So for example, I, I have to actually pay a lot of my mom's car fines because the UK has been rolling, UK government roll out all these like innovative ways to like monitor whether people are driving too fast. And um, they, you can actually go online and register and digitize your, the, the process of paying fines. But my mom doesn't know how to do that and my grandma, grandmother doesn't know how to do that. So, so even though it's meant to be there to help them, they struggle. 
But if, again, if you look at Cambodia now, the, the, the people that will be 60, 70 years old in 20 years time or 30 years time, many of them are, are more technology savvy. So actually it's going to create, they say there's going to create a whole new economy now. It's going to be called the, I think it's called the silver economy, right? It's, it's basically the technology for older people, um, how you can make life more comfortable, health services, insurance, you know, all of that's going to be completely transformed. A lot of these sectors like health insurance are still very traditional. But as people get older that are more technology savvy, we see a lot of potential to disrupt and uh, reform those sectors as well. Okay. Um, any of our speakers tend to disagree or you guys are on the same page? I see what's on that. I think we're on the same page. And from our experience, um, the business owner who are probably f over 50, although they are not digitally savvy, but if we have the necessary resources to provide to them, they are more willing to adopt it. So for example, during COVID-19, uh, we had businesses pitching from probably Mundogiri or Stung Trang province. And uh, we told them you had to prepare a slide presentation. And what they did was probably send us a Microsoft Word document. And we need to paste it into PowerPoint slides. So, so that was the challenge. But again, we could see the commitment, but uh, their willingness to be able to uh, use digital to get uh, support from client enterprise. And we, they also asked their nephews uh, to set up a Zoom uh, meeting for them as well. And they used their mobile phone to conduct their presentation. And that shows uh, that they are willing to use digital uh, uh, resources to uh, uh, get support. Uh, I, I think uh, the um, uh, opportunity is to provide more resources uh, and, and the means. Uh, for them to adopt this uh, digital uh, innovation that they can improve their businesses. Thank you. Mong Samrat, yes. Yeah, so um, I think if we, if we think it's a challenge, it will be a challenge. So if we think it will be it's opportunity, it will be an opportunity. Because every view has a different, um, a, a different uh, uh, mindset that they they, they are positive or negative. And for the, for the entrepreneur itself, I think if they treat it as an opportunity, they just find the way that they, they build a, a technology or maybe easy app that, that they also can introduce to the older people and get money from them because they have a lot of money. For the young people, you don't have a lot of money than older people. But why don't you? Why don't you, you play a role that you introduce an easy way that the older people can, can use and they get inspired by the simple way and get to adopt other technology. But if we look at the uh, digital adoption in, in Cambodia, so the rate is, is still low, but the center of the digital adoption is, is in, the, in the age between 18 to uh, 34, so 70 percent account accounted to the overall uh, digital adoption. So we still have uh, the opportunity to uh, teach the older and educate um, the younger uh, to, play, to play a very active role in the, in the digital uh, way of, um, of uh, 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 digital adoption or uh, transformation. Even the company, uh, um, that they, they also can use the uh, digital to transform their operation as well. But I know the change is hard, even our company during the COVID time, last two years, um, we, start, we started implementing the digital transformation. Our, our team is young, like around 23 or something, but still hard. We know this is the challenge, but they have the commitment, as Watana said. They have the commitment. So he can prove that older have uh, that commitment. So for the young people, they have more commitment more commitment uh, to, um, to involve in the digital already. Um, so the challenge is now, but maybe it's not for next 20 years. Maybe you want to mention that older will die or something, I don't know. But, <laughs> but in the next 20 years, it might be um, easier, but we have to start from now. 
So we start to communicate, we start to educate the people how to adopt to the, to the uh, technology and digital world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, we, we hear a lot from our speakers today. Everyone has their unique idea. Um, I have one last question before we wrap up the, this discussion, and then I'm going to open the floor for a few questions. I am told that I, we have a little bit of time. Um, my next question is that now we've got policymakers sitting here, right? We've got the government um, organizing this. And um, I want to hear from you. Um, right now, there are CADT, there are training centers in techs, there are um, efforts in increasing tech talents in Cambodia. What more do we have to do? Are there something that we haven't done and we should do? Like, what do you think? Sorry, this is not prepared question. Yeah. This is a follow-up. Okay. Yeah. So again, I, I'm I'm looking at it from a regional perspective. I'm not familiar with all the programs in Cambodia, but I'd like to give an example of what I saw in Indonesia. So the, the, in Indonesia, there was actually a really interesting um, startup we looked at called Binar Academy that provided a service to improve the digital technological skills of, of the population, but actually without any government support. It was just a, a startup um, set up by founders that saw this as a huge market opportunity in Indonesia, that there was an undersupply of the people with the right skills for the corporates to, um, to recruit. So they had a really interesting business model. They're generating um, success fees from corporates that are paying them to, to match and um, improve the skills of the workers of the companies. And um, yeah, we were very close to investing in them, but unfortunately we didn't. But actually the company is Why? Doing... Why? Why didn't you invest in them? Um, <laughs> what, is this on video? No. <laughs> it's okay. Well, no, it's no. Okay. I mean, we, we really like the team. But, um, but actually, the, um, you know, our, our investment committee uh, knocked it back. But maybe there was... Because I think their impact was more on the gender impact and the education impact. But we are a climate impact fund. So it was probably just a slight misalignment in terms of our social economic impact indicators. But as a company... Their, their company is doing really well, and they've gone on to raise. Um, they were seed stage when we saw them. They now they raised Series A, five million dollars of funding, and they're they're growing and doing really well. But anyway, the reason I mention this example is that there may also be purely private sector solutions uh, to this problem. Um, it doesn't always have to be just the public sector. So I guess as the government, you can also have a look at like how to work with the private sector or how to attract these types of companies to Cambodia as well. Thanks. Great. Um, it's a great example of a disruptive company um, which is making a difference, which is increasing tech talents. Um, anything else from our other speakers or are we okay here? Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to open the floor for questions and if you have questions, please raise your hand and then our organizing committee can come to you with a microphone and at the same time, meanwhile, I think our speakers can just take a sip of water any of you want to use the restroom? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm Ponya. That, um, thank you for the, um, the session. I learned a lot from the, the panels here. Um, my, my question was, uh, uh, is going about the future investment, which is related to the green finance, because currently the, you know, the the new dynamics of the investment I saw in Asian, they just released the green or fair finance that they are looking at the performance, uh, both performance uh, of the investor and also the fund recipient. Is it the kind of create more complexity for you guys to review the, the, you know, the, the, the business that you are going to provide the fund? because you will create a lot of criteria whether the business, um, uh, let's say, they uh, operate and affect to the environment, human rights, uh, social aspect. And as startup, you know, a lot of chaotic. Uh, and we need to think about a lot of things, how startup get the complexity 
of that kind of the investment in the future. Thank you. Do you want me to reframe the question or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so, you know, thanks, that's a really good question. Um, actually, what people often confuse is between um, ESG investing and um, green impact investing. They're actually slightly different. So um, ESG investing, and there's a lot of money now in the world that's going towards ESG investing, is, means that you invest in companies that will not do harm to the environment or they will not do harm to the social economic situations or they adopt um, good governance structure. So actually, almost any business can be ESG, uh, even if they are not green. Yeah, like, uh, so, so that, and there is a lot of ESG investment now that's becoming available because for large Japanese banks, Korean banks, European financial institutions, their shareholders are putting pressure on them that they want the company to be ESG compliant. Then what you were talking about, green impact, that's slightly different. There are also investors that want their money to go to the class of assets that are um, driving improved environmental outcomes or reducing the CO2 emissions. There is also more and more money now uh, in that area too, uh, because as you see, even last week in Egypt, uh, the COP, there's a lot of commitment from the government, from the corporates to green their supply chain in Asia. And um, actually for me in our, our funds, when we raise funds, we see the trend in Europe and in Asia that more and more investors want to invest in these green funds. Um, what does that mean for Cambodia? I, I mean, I think, again, we talked about the high potential for agriculture in this uh, country. So actually agriculture and climate and green, they are almost overlapping 100% because if you want to really grow and be efficient and productive, you also need to have a, um, efficient agriculture and clean agriculture. Can you manage the the natural resource, um, reduce the de rate of deforestation, Im improve the efficiency in which you use the land and the water to grow the product. I think in this area, there's a high potential to mobilize green financing to, to uh, Cambodia. Thanks. Do we answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Um, we have a bit of time for one or two more questions. Yes. Yes, thanks for a um, uh, meaningful um, pr presentation from all panelists. So I'm Sukita Tu, I'm the Vice President of Cambodian e-business association. So I have um, two burning questions. So one in regarding to agri-tech and agriculture, because uh, most of our um, members, they are working at um, grassroots level. So I'm wondering whether um, from um, my enterprise, from ADB or from uh, CIC, how many percentage that you invest with um, community like um, agricultural corporation? Because normally they don't really have a legal registration. So are you working with them as well? And to what extent? So it's my first question. And the second question that I have in mind because um, you uh, link up to the green uh, business because in some provinces that I uh, visit uh, recently, so we really want to uh, combine the agribusiness and ecotourism. So how um, you look at um, these two combinations and how investment uh, it can be uh, taken to this kind of initiative? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, responding to your first question, I think um, most of the grant funding that we provided to the entrepreneurs in the agricultural space is more than 50%. So during COVID-19, we supported more than a uh, million dollars to around 100 plus uh, startups and SMEs in uh, Cambodia. And we mostly focused on the startups and SMEs but not uh, agricultural cooperative. Um, so the profile of the uh, support that we provide is directly to the owner and of the businesses that they 
only have co-founders or they are running it with their family. But we, are, we have other programs that we support agricultural cooperative uh, in which w uh, we provide uh, capacity upgrading uh, in probably around uh, a couple of provinces that they, that Khmer Enterprise provided um, uh, stipends to students in order to uh, work with the agri agricultural cooperative uh, on the business aspect so that the agricultural cooperative, the AC, can actually know more about how to run the business, uh, not just on the technical aspect, so that they have more bargaining power, they can uh, get higher price uh, for their products. So, uh, responding to your questions, uh, it's more than 50% of the support that we provide to uh, agricultural entrepreneurs. Uh, the second point, I think um, these support that we provide to agricultural companies, but also the, they also have ecotourism uh, uh, business side of it. Um, it's not that much uh, uh, for now. But I think I can see that uh, the trend is uh, going really well, that uh, the agricultural companies, they also have uh, a uh, new business model where they have their own farm, but at the same time, they request some funding for us to upgrade their farm to attract more tourists in order to come to their farm. So we think that this is a good combination, uh, a good revenue stream that it can generate in addition to the agricultural product that they produce. But at the same time, they can uh, promote the, their province, especially in their locale, uh, on how the uh, produce is made, how it is planted. Uh, it's, it's a good revenue stream for them uh, on top of the agricultural um, products that they sell in the market. So uh, from CIC itself, we didn't work with the agriculture cooperative yet because we think the legal framework might not fit well to our investment uh, philosophy. But maybe we, we, we didn't look at the deal um, uh, carefully. I, I think that, that might be. So maybe I, I can request the investment team to look at uh, how uh, we can, uh, we can uh, 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 look at the deal in, into um, the agriculture cooperative. Some might be sizable enough for the investment and they are ready to get the investment. We don't know, so we, we are not in the ground yet. But, but that is good that you have the, the proposal that uh, if you, we work with the agriculture, so what kind of the investment that we made so far? So we met with the, the register company for sure. Our investment, we have to, um, um, to, to invest into the register uh, business. So any startup that they are not uh, registered yet, I think um, we can work together and reframe after investment, you have to register. This is for sure. Um, for the green, Eco and ag a agriculture and eco tourism, um, we are keen to look at into the deal. So any any possibility that um, you can bring the deal to us for uh, the study or due diligence, I think we are happy to look at into the deal because um, in our investment priority, we all we already put agriculture uh, related into our uh, mandate as well. Yeah, thank you. Ben. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, I don't think we have enough time to take the questions, um, and I'd like to wrap up this panel. But before I, before I wrap up, I'd like to remind you that if you need to talk to any one of them individually, please feel free to reach out to them after this panel. And uh, last but not least, thank you so much uh, for coming in today and uh, answering questions and engaging in the discussion. And uh, we've touched a lot on the challenges, the barriers in the investment landscape. We also talked about the future outlook of investment in Cambodia and also the issues with the tech talents, which is the main theme of our event. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I will see you down uh, at the backstage. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please give them another big round of applause for a very fruitful discussion.
Before we proceed to the very last speaker of the Cambodia Tech Expo 2022, I would like to ask everyone to wait a few minutes for our team to clear up the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have one more session to hand out the certificate to our sponsor. Please be seated. I would like to invite everyone to proceed to your seat before we proceed to the next session. As the Cambodia Tech Expo 2022 is coming close to an end, I would like to invite His Excellency Dr. Chan Meta Khan, Secretary of State, Ministry of Industry, Science, Technology and Innovation, to come up on the stage, wrap up the Investments and Startup Festival. Good. Afternoon, everyone. I, I won't take you guys longer because I think we had three days, full three days, conference and expo. I think you guys are might be tired as all. Well. So first of all, I just would like to thank our Sunak Prime Minister for endorsing the CTX 2022 as the sign event of the ASEAN Summit and Related Summit. Also, His Excellency Deputy Prime Minister, Akhya Abdul Sapiacha on Pom Nirwan, Minister of Economy and Finance, and His Excellency Senior Minister, Minister of Industry, Science, Technology, and Innovation, for their support to make this CTX happen. We don't forget also our sponsors. We have diamond sponsors, we have gold, silver, and bronze sponsor. We would be more than happy next year or next 10 years. Bronze will be upgraded to silver, silver will be upgraded to gold, gold will be upgraded to diamond, Diamond will be upgraded to platinum, for example. So we would be happy to organize that kind of event for you guys. This is the role of MISTI as the Ministry of STI in charge of science, technology, and innovation for this kind of promotion for our youth. We need our youth to be aware about technology. We need our youth to take care and to learn technology. Surely, what do you mean by young? If Cambodia is aging now, how do you define 
the age of young population. You guys are still young. Even you guys are 40 or 50, you guys are still young. Because of, we need to work for our future, our next generation. So we are here to build an ecosystem. MISTI is building the ecosystem. MISTI is working on the coordination with the line ministries to be here to listen to you guys. MISTI is here to try to collaborate with other stakeholders to listen to your concerns. We are here to solve your concerns. We are here to share your concerns and to raise it up to our leaders. Last year, I still remember, I met all the startup around for the first time in October. In October last year, I met you guys, all the startup, the young ones. What I can do for you? I was asking that kind of questions. I want, I still want to do something for you guys. Help us, please help us for building an ecosystem. I was eight years at the MPTC, at the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication, to build a startup ecosystem since 2014 to 2021. Now I'm still working on this. This is what I have promised to you guys to build a platform, the startup platform, the investment readiness platform for you guys to be scaled up. We need to scale up now. We need a scale up, sorry. Incubation is quite, it takes a bit long now. We need to be scaled up. We need to go regional. We need to go global. We need more investors. But you guys have to be capable of getting at the level of investors. How we can get funding from investors. How we convince investors to invest in your products or solutions. That's why we are here. And after the meeting, I got COVID. So after meeting you guys, three days later, I got COVID. This is, I remember, I got data, but it was okay. Before preparing this session, I met all the startup at the factory of Phnom Penh. All of you, most all of you, raised the concerns of taxation. The point is, I have tried my best to invite His Excellency Kung Vibol to be with you all yesterday afternoon. He just came back from the Australia in the morning, stuck in the sky for one hour because our President Biden was coming also. And he did come, he was here to listen to your concern. But no one has been asking any question to him related to taxation. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 2019, when we organized Digital Cambodia, he was there also with us. This year, like yesterday, he was with us again. With Lok Chum Tio Chia Ratha, under Secretary of State of Misty, she will coordinate with GD of taxation. So you guys will have a consultation you guys will have a dialogue 
the startup will have a dialogue with His Excellency Kung Vibot to solve taxation issues for startup. Be ready. Okay? Any concerns, he will be there to listen to you guys. He will be there to solve. He will be there to find the solutions on how we are going to promote innovations. We don't want to put taxation as an issue, as a barrier of innovation, of scaling you guys up, of blocking you guys going regional. No, it is not our top objective. Our objective right now, we are going to build a platform. Misty will be there also to coordinate with GD Tax to solve your problem. So you guys won't have any more concerns or questions related to, to taxation. Second issues, which just have been approved by His Excellency Senior Minister a few hours ago, related of related the theme of our CTX. CTX is happening with the ASEAN Summit. Same time. We finish the same time. ASEAN Summit team is ASEAN ACT. ASEAN addressing challenges together through nothing. First, we focus on through tech talents. Tech talents becoming more and more critical, more and more crucial not only for the private sector, but also for educational institution. No one is choosing STEM now. The rate of our high school students choosing STEM is going down. While the OGC, the Royal Government of Cambodia, is promoting digital transformation. Enterprise go digital. MSME go digital. We need people. We need more tech talents to be completing the lack of the shortage of our labor. Electronic and automobile roadmap is being finalized by the Royal Government of Cambodia. Recently, you may hear many news related to automobile industry, electronic industry. Korean investors in manufacturing, in semiconductor manufacturing, is working with MISTI now on how we are going to attract them to Cambodia. Put the next market for semiconductor manufacturing. We are working on this. But we must, we must be ready also for our young tech talents. His Excellency Senior Minister approved for developing, for preparing the long-term tech talent development framework in line with the long-term strategy for digital economy and society framework. We need a rollout plan to make sure that we would reach the goal of digital economy and society by 2035. This is the role of the Royal Government of Cambodia. This is the role of MISTI with other line ministries, but also it is the role of tech startup. It is the role of private sectors. It is the role of our investors to join hand together
to make it happen by 2035. The third point is about collaboration and coordination. You may hear a lot from Mr. Kung Bol yesterday related to people approach. We need to talk to each other. This event, this platform, allow you guys to meet physically, not via Zoom anymore. We are living in the COVID, in the new normal. We need to meet each other to discuss, to share. I need money, I need funding. We need more innovation for MSMEs. MSME need to be more competitive, need to be more innovative. MSME need to get the access of funding. We have FinTech stage here. This time forum, we would convince the MEF to be with us. The committee to prepare the FinTech policy is with us. We have three stages. In this five building, we have startup stage, just move from the building F to here, because next we are going to have the farewell party. We have the FinTech stage, which focus on earlier one question has been raised related to InsureTech, cybersecurity in insurance. InsureTech has been discussed at FinTech stage. We have blockchain topic. We have InsureTech topic. We have the landscape of FinTech policy in Cambodia. So many topics have been discussed at the FinTech stage, the current ones, the updated ones, and the trendy ones. Startup stage, the same thing. You have data center. You have, of course, how to get funding because it is a topic of the main objective of our platform. How to make our startup to be ready to get funding. We have to go regional now. We need to build a network with the region. Of course, we have the main stage focusing more on the policy and regulatory framework, but we're still working in with the private sector, academia, to share perspective, the view on how we are going to address together to build an ecosystem for our tech talents in the future. This is I would like to share with you guys the three points, the key takeaway from CTX. For startup, be ready for the first point. Second point and the third point, be ready to work together. Stay with us. We solve the problem together. It's not for us. It's not for you guys, for your children, for your grandchildren, for the next generation. We're looking forward to the Jolie wedding, make more kids for Cambodian, the next generation of Cambodian. Many couple, I mean NCTX, getting married. Yesterday also, you guys get married, but don't forget also to make kids, okay? Finally, I think, uh, I, I want to be cool, you know, but I cannot because I have another duty to hand over the certificate for our sponsors and our partners. And then we're going to have the farewell party, the farewell party for CTX 2020. And we're going to look forward the next CTX. Our senior minister said next year. So if he said next year, we are going to see you guys all next year. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best success, be working together closely, join hands together for the future of our tech talents. Thank you. I would like to ask His Excellency Doctor to still stay on stage and hand out the certificate to our sponsor.
पहले 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 I would like to invite the representative from Viettel Cambodia PTE LTD Medphone to come on stage, please, as our gold sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Kromhon Kosetel to come on stage, please, as our gold sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Ed.co Cambodia Co Ltd to come on stage please as our gold sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Ratakotak Swayat Krong Phnom Penh to come on stage please as our silver sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Prince Bank PLC to come on stage please as our silver sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Phnom Penh Commercial Bank to come on stage please as our silver sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Satapana Bank PLC to come on stage please as our silver sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Mobile CNC Cambodia Co Ltd to come on stage please as our silver sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Huawei Technology Co Ltd to come on stage please as our silver sponsor.
I would like to invite the representative from Binance to come on stage, please, as our bronze sponsor. I would like to invite the representative from Khmer Enterprise to come on stage, please, as our bronze sponsor. I would like to invite our event plan partner, Compass Advertising Co. Ltd. to come on stage, please. I would like to invite the representative from Tube Cafe Co Ltd as our event partner to come on stage please. I would like to invite the representative from Subby Digital Corporation LTD to come on stage please as our event partner. I would like to invite the representative from Bangkok Solutions to come on stage, please, as our event partner. I would like to invite the representative from Quantum Engineering and Manufacturing to come on stage, please, as our event partner. I would like to invite the representative from Seal Animation Studio to come on stage, please, as our event partner. I would like to invite all sponsor and event partner to come on stage please for the group picture.
bring back. Now I would like to announce the ending of Cambodia Tech Expo 2022. Thank you so much everyone for being part of it and please join us the farewell party. I would like to invite all our support team to come on stage, please, for the group picture.